Okay, chapter 13 is going to talk about something that we've already should know a little bit about, and that's the states of matter. So we have four main states of matter in science. We have solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. We're going to first start talking about gas. Now, we're also going to refer to something called the kinetic molecular theory. The kinetic molecular theory describes the behavior in terms of motion, kinetic energy being energy in motion, of molecules. And we're going to talk about gases mostly because gases have the most kinetic energy because they're moving. If we wave our hands right now, you can feel the gases hitting your hands. And so this model that we're going to try to take in takes a few assumptions into play, size, motion, and energy of the gas particles. Larger gas particles are going to move slower than small gas particles, like hydrogen is going to move faster than carbon dioxide, which is fairly heavy um, compared in comparison. Um, this is also why when you suck helium, your voice gets super high because the gas particles are very small, helium having an average atomic mass of two. Um, but if you take something like argon in, argon again and another noble gas, your voice drops. And it's because it's very heavy and so that's moving slower so your vocal cords can't move at their normal rate. So here's what we need to know. There is no such thing as empty space. The gas particles are going to separate um, by each other we call empty space but really in physics there's no empty space. There's always like a electron in that space or some type of subatomic particle in that space. Those gas particles are in constant random motion and they're always colliding between the other gas particles and um, the sides of a container. But no kinetic energy is lost. When it hits another gas particle and it's moving really fast, it will actually transfer some of that energy to the next gas particle, allowing it to move faster. This is how we get a state of matter change. Usually the increase in kinetic energy is also in relationship to addition of like thermal energy to the situation. So here's two um, factors for particle um, kinetic energy. One, you should know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. That's an equation from freshman year. We're bringing it back. You can definitely put that onto your periodic tables as well. So how do we increase the kinetic energy or the energy in motion of an object? Well, first off, when we talk about velocity, velocity is a vector, not a scalar, which means velocity has speed, meters per second, and direction. And so you're actually going north or south or left or right or up or down. There's something with that. Mass is not matter and it's not weight. Mass is how much a particle or how much uh, matter a particle is taking up without gravity's effect. And so gravity added to it is how we get weight. So weight is equal to your mass times gravity, being different on every planet. So how do we increase the kinetic energy? Um, well, temperature. As you increase the temperature, such as we put an ice cube straight from the freezer it's in solid state. If we stick it onto in a plate and then stick that plate onto a hot plate, you're going to start to see it start to change forms. When you turn the hot plate on, you're adding thermal energy to that. And so thermal energy is going to help increase the kinetic energy. And so the particle's kinetic energy is increasing, it will be able to change states of matter, going from a solid to a liquid, and eventually, if it's left on long enough, a gas. So as the temperature increases, your kinetic energy increases. And as your temperature decreases, your kinetic energy decreases, giving them a direct relationship to one another. So we have to explain some behaviors when we're talking about this. So one of them is compression expansion. Expansion is when molecules move away from each other. Compression is when they move closer together. Some fun stuff about the compression and expansion. If you're able to have a large amount of empty space between the air particles, um, this allows it easily to push the volume down. So if you would take a big syringe, and there's some in the cabinet above lab station four on the second shelf, and you fill it with air, 20 cc's, and you put your hand over the end and you push it down, you won't, the plunger won't go all the way to the bottom. 
The reason it won't go all the way to the bottom is because there's air particles and they're taking that space up. Now you can compress them down, but you can't go all the way. Just enough to remove all the empty space. If you were strong enough, which I'm sorry none of you are, it's okay, I'm not either. Um, if you were able to push that down without breaking the plastic syringe, it could go from a gas to a solid with enough pressure. But honestly, humanly kind of impossible, or sorry, improbable to do that, your syringe would probably break first. And so when we start looking at this, you have to realize that the density of those particles will allow for a certain compression. The more particles that are in there will only allow for it to compress as far as um, it will based on the amount. Expansion, however, is a little bit different. When we're expanding, we're able to pull that syringe out. Now, if we push the end of that same syringe, we have it 20 cc's, we push it all the way down, it will pop back up to 20 cc's. If we put it at 10 cc's and we put our finger over the lid and we try to pull it up to 20, you're gonna find some resistance at a certain spot. You can expand, but only to a certain point, and that's because you still have this push and pull going on here. Now, we have this called diffusion and effusion. Now you notice there's a link on this for a HTP. That link is your second video you're gonna be watching, and that is going to be on Graham's Law. So, let's talk about gas particles and how they flow past one another. So gas is able to flow. We also call gas a fluid because you can put it in a pipe and it will move through it. So we have two things, diffusion and effusion. Diffusion is a term used to describe the movement of one material through another. So if you take air freshener and you spray it in a large quantity in one corner of the room, by the end of the hour, the back corner of the room, the opposite end, the furthest distance from it, you should smell that air freshener. It will diffuse evenly throughout the entire face or space. Effusion is a process related to diffusion for small amounts of a gas um, which escape through small openings. Such as, not only are you going to smell that air freshener in my room, but you may smell it in the hallway. Well, we have these things called doors. Even if the door stays shut for the entire hour, which we do during cat dissection. People can tell when we're doing cat dissection because you can smell it in the hallway. And these small little spaces around allow for gas to escape. And so Graham's Law of Effusion states that the rate of effusion for a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass of that gas. And uh, in your periodic table, or sorry, in your textbook on page 387, there's two equations for Graham's Law. You can write both of those onto your periodic tables. The video is going to go into a little bit more detail going through Graham's Law. Monday, we're going to do a lab on Graham's Law as well, which would then I can then explain some of that to you. So, let's talk about gas pressure. Pressure is defined as the force per unit area. So, gas particles exert a pressure when colliding with the walls of their container. Because the gas particles um, has little mass, it can exert little pressure onto the sides of its container. We will usually have a standard atmospheric measurement of ATMs. This is defined as the pressure that supports 766 millimeter column of mercury. We also, the SI unit for pressure is pascals and we can also use kilopascals for this as well. So how do we measure pressure? Well, we use a thing called a barometer. And so one unit of mercury is put into that barometer to help measure the atmospheric pressure. Mercury, even though it is a toxic substance, is really good um, for scientific instruments. So an Italian physicist, Torsini, was the first to demonstrate that air, that air exerts pressure. He noticed that water pumps were unable to pump water higher than about 10 meters. He hypothesized that the height of the column of the liquid would vary with the density of the liquid. So he had to test this idea. So he filled a thin glass tube um, 
and then closed one end of the tube with mercury. He then covered the open end so that the air could not enter and he inverted the tube and placed it onto a dish of mercury. The open end was below the surface of the mercury dish and the height of the mercury in the tube would fill to about 25 or sorry 75 centimeters. Mercury is about 13.6 times denser than water and so he did determine um, that this instrument was very accurate at measuring atmospheric pressure and he called this instrument a barometer and we refer to it as barometric pressure. So when we talk about pressure there's some units you need to know. One of the SI unit for pressure is Pascal's. And so the barometer will measure the absolute pressure. Um, that is the total pressure exerted by all gases in the atmosphere. So as the atmosphere changes, the types of gas will change, the atmospheric pressure will change. Because there is no difference, um, because there are so many different pressure units, the International Community of Scientists um, will say that the SI unit is pounds per square inch or PSIs. Um, but almost all engineers in the United States do not use the Pascal unit. In fact, you're going to find that we do convert quite a few things. And so here are the pressure units. So 1 atm, again, write this on your periodic table. 1 atm is equal to 760 um, mmHgs or mercuries, which is equal to 14.7 psi's, which is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So these are all equal to one another. You also have a table on page 390, which explains this if you would rather put that table onto your periodic tables. It's table 13-1. You can go ahead and put that one on as well. And this alludes back to our famous guy, John Dalton. Because John Dalton came up um, with his partial pressures. And so basically with this is Dalton... Um, his law states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the pressure of all the gases within the mixture. So you would have, you can write this equation on your, on your periodic tables, you would have your total pressure is equal to pressure 1 plus, which is gas 1, plus pressure 2, plus pressure 3, and so on and so forth, so all the pressures are actually added up within that system. And so this isn't a hard law, you just basically are combining all the different ATMs and so if you have oxygen carbon dioxide nitrogen and they all have their own pressure such as nitrogen has a pressure of 0 0.12 ATMs carbon dioxide has a pressure of 0 0.7 ATMs and oxygen is unknown but you know the total pressure is 0 0.97 ATMs you would simply put O2 or the pressure of oxygen is equal to the total pressure minus carbon dioxide minus nitrogen, giving you a total pressure for oxygen of 0 0.15 atms. It's basically simple addition for these problems. They're very, very easy. You are given these particles are not found, um, typically uh, with the instruments that we have capable in high school science, unless we're using some veneer software. Okay, so you have an assignment which is going to be due on Monday. Please refer to your assignment sheet in the About section for Chapter 13. Alright, have a good day you guys.